the winter was coming and Lady Baronia Jackson was taking one last melancholy walk around the now deserted grounds of her estate. The money had run out and she'd been forced to sell. In her pocket was the love letter she had written earlier in the year when she had felt so alive, so full of hope. Sitting down upon a bench, she began to read this foreign tongue that once had been her own. If, at one time, academia has been able to prove its cutting-edge credentials by complaining of the Academy's lack of commitment to addressing relevant concerns, we might now argue that because of an increasingly violent infringement of economic injunctions to which we must respond, it has become impossible to address anything else. As a result, the cutting-edge and capital now find themselves embroiled in peculiar copulations. If, at one time, Henry Kissinger could supposedly state that, quote, academic politics are so vicious precisely because the stakes are so small, end quote. It is now the case that the politics infringing upon academic politics are so overbearing that academics have no choice but to posture as if the stakes involved were enormous. As a result, failure to do so convincingly is but the prelude to a quick trip to the chop house, funding slash your area nudge towards extinction. If academia has indeed become a completely Protestant affair, producing ghastly research driven by the dreary instrumentality of its worth ethic, it is time now to imagine it as something else. As a result, and picking up on an image that I dropped likely into an article of mine in 2009, my paper will consist of a monologue in which musicology will appear before you as a lazy Catholic lady who spends her life staring out the window, smoking cigarettes, and waiting for her unemployment check to arrive. <laughs> Lady Baronia Jackson exhaled smoke and sighed, <laughs> then walked off to the car awaiting to take her off into the uncertainties of her future life. A dear friend of mine once told me, uh, I, I beg your pardon, what? Which friend? Well, I'm sure nobody you know, dear. They're really not anybody at all. What? Well, if you must split hairs, fair enough, I suppose. I'll try and start again, Lord. So, nobody once told me about this hilarious abstract she read for a conference. Apparently some perfectly insignificant musicologist, middle-aged, male, boarding, gay, waistline going a little south, had written this thing under the pseudonym Lady Baronia Jackson. Now, since nobody likes to be entertained, she went to the conference <laughs> expecting the gentle titillation of a little light drag, only to find that said musicologist simply read the paper in civilian garb. I asked nobody what she thought about this nobody's rather cryptic conceit, and she said, Well, as my mother would say, these days, dear, we're all in drag. And you know, I think she's got a point. I mean, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, it's as if we all now live under the law of bloody alchemy and are constantly having to rise to the occasion of transforming the shitty base metals of our humdrum existences into some kind of shimmering gold. See this turd of a human being that stands before you. Now watch as before your very eyes he turns into a beautiful woman. See this anxious nobody struggling to endure his own shame. Now be amazed as he towers into being as a mighty, confident somebody. At any rate, that's the ideal, which is bad enough. The reality is that we spend hours in the dressing room practicing our flawless imitation of someone else's tired old tune, in payment for which we get to go and rot in some cubicle, really. In such a world, the aristocracy are now those who somehow still have the dignity never to even bother trying to come into view. So good for him. Good for him. Come see Lady Baronia Jackson, a middle-aged, balding musicologist who'll make not a single worthwhile impression upon your being. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Lady Baronia Jackson is a writer and performer whose lectures and publications have appeared in a broad array of venues and formats. <laughs> She's an associate professor teaching music history and philosophy at the University of Buffalo, where she is also on the faculty of the Centre for the Study of Psychoanalysis and Culture. And in the spring of 2015, she was a full-time guest professor in the Department of Music at New York University. Her academic work, such as her monograph, Music and the Politics of Negation, and her widely read 2009 piece, Music After All, has taken place at the points of 
vexed intersection between music history, philosophy, politics and creative writing. And she's been at the forefront of musicological critique of the continuing ideological imbrications of our scholarly methodologies and assumptions. Her present academic project, tentatively titled Temenos, Boundaries of Musical Life, is an extended critique of our continuing assumption of the value of ideas and metaphors of openness and seeks to investigate the strategic valence of closure and closing off within the dialectical conundrums of late capitalist modernity. In addition to her academic work, Lady Baronia Jackson, under the stage name James Robert Curry, has also been active as a performance artist, creating pieces that employ a tragicomic aesthetic modality in order to investigate the fragility of the subjective positions and identities that are demanded of us in our troubled time. She has also worked as a poet and librettist in collaboration with composers, notably Diana So, for whom she wrote the opera libretto Down the Lane. Um, she is a noted beauty smoker and last of the great lovers. Please help me in welcoming Lady Brennan. <laughs> Truly, we've lost the art of doing nothing. That, of course, is the price we have paid for our good health. Since we lost the art of doing nothing when we finally abandoned smoking in order to go wandering in the desert of instrumental pragmatism. I would argue that the truth of this is given to us by means of the authority of some of our ascetic reactions at least for those of us who still experience such things and haven't abandoned them too. For example, to the good health of our sociological observations, our penetrating critique, our political diagnoses. The aesthetic, after all, is awfully unfashionable. And so I only talk to you about it whilst in camouflage and drag as James Robert Curry, whoever she may be. Um, maybe there are some of you who are ancient enough to remember when people used to smoke in restaurants. Without doubt, there were many things quite uncharming about this. But one thing of great beauty was the way in which dining partners who smoked, particularly lovers, were able then to be in each other's presence without the embarrassment that usually comes when we face each other without the protective barrier of seeming like we are doing something useful. Today, between courses, lovers bury themselves in their phones, fearful that they might lose contact with the web of connections that constitute the world they imagine they belong to beyond their lover. Aesthetically, it is grotesque to behold. Because if we have lost the art of doing nothing, I would argue that we have lost the art of loving too. In the past, for the mere price of potentially terrible health issues, one could, through smoking, simply be before somebody. <laughs> Much more naked than merely being without clothes, one's soul dressed only in a burning tip, smoke and a small pile of ash. You could be nothing before the one you loved. And without the dignity that comes from being so, everything else you do is the mere scuttle of fear. Between the ages of four and nine, I wore women's clothing whenever I could and called myself Lady Baronia Jackson. Or, if you were an intimate, you were allowed to call me by my at-home name, which was Patricia Jackson. <laughs> Considering that this was the mid-1970s and I was growing up in a particularly grotty part of South East London, this, if you'll excuse the conflict of metaphors, took some balls. <laughs> Years later, one of the long line of therapists I have paraded my psyche before assumed a classic face of concern and asked, so why did Lady Bar Bronia Jackson leave? Where did she go? <laughs> <laughs> This reduced me to the state of a crumpled, crying beetroot, whose only retort amidst the sobs was, I'm so
This is, in fact, true. Um, I have no recollection of the details of this persona to whom, like Ariel to Prospero, I was indentured, and moreover for such an inordinately long time. Five years as a young child, after all, is tantamount to a life sentence. If she had any content or narrative, they have been irretrievably lost to the past. All of that I remember, if you'll excuse my rather fanciful conceit, is her wordless song, a music for whom no credible meaning can be assigned, no composer snatched from interment. She is my ghost tune, haunting the corridors of time and place, but who can never be found at home, and so slips through my fingers as they reach to grasp. At this strikingly sad moment, in the history of what we might call the human project. I take a certain comfort from this. For since no amount of musicological sleuthing can unearth her manuscript, <clears throat> that means that she is now safe. <clears throat> Somehow, she managed to step to the side of the torrents of historical time and is nestled in some cosy nook in some other dimension of the past that this ugly present will never access. All that remains is her form, my memory that when I was her, I participated in the life of beauty. And since she is now nothing, she is the source of whatever dignity to me remains. When in the summer, Lady Baronia Jackson had sat down to write her abstract. She had thought that by November her paper would constitute a hilarious joke. <laughs> Whilst it was true that she was jaded enough not to confuse her expectation for optimism, she did not deny that her desire to be witty bespoke of a willingness to remain being charged. And so she had taken comfort in believing that her abstract was proof that she was still on the side of life. Come November, she had suffered the fate of having become an employee of the most uninspired of metaphors. And the bountiful salary of life had been replaced with the minimum wage of a rather thin existentialism. <laughs> the political season had changed and the cold had come. The leaves became jaundiced on the trees and it seemed to her that it was God himself exhaling from his cigarette that made the gust that brought them fluttering hopelessly yellow to the ground. The beginning of winter, dead trees surrounded by the discarded golden coins of a currency no longer in circulation. She sat before the accusation of the blank page before her on which her paper was refusing to sprout, dressed in nothing but her dignity because she now had nothing to say. As a tear swelled towards the unmarked porcelain of her cheek, she sensed something fundamental about herself coming into focus that she had never properly acknowledged, and she knew that the clarity of this vision was charged by the fact that it had come before her in order to say goodbye, and was now on the verge of disappearing for the final time back into the darkness of the past from whence it came. All she had wanted were for things to be beautiful. But the barbarians had come, and now everything would have to fight. She let the tear finish its journey onto the empty page, then lit a cigarette and looked out at the bare trees. I know, I know, you're all terribly, terribly busy, and no doubt you're awfully, awfully important too. So you probably haven't read my abstract. <laughs> Fair enough, I suppose. But as my mother would say, well, we're all busy. <laughs> of course, whilst you were all being so terribly, terribly busy, you might have found yourselves being awfully, awfully on top of things too, in which case you've probably read my abstract. <laughs> Fair enough, I suppose, but as my mother would say, well, we're all on top of things. <laughs> 
really, what can I say? You're damned if you've read it, and damned if you haven't, too. You see, there's no winning with me. I'm not, after all, a racy kind of girl. There's no on your marks, get set, go. No gripping dash for the finish line, no bronze, silver or gold. <laughs> no. Um, you see, it's not because you've impressed me that I like you so terribly, terribly much, as I most awfully, awfully do. No, no. Far from it, my dears. Um, you've left no impression upon me whatsoever at all. <laughs> I mean, look at this face. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be bashful. Have a good old gawp at it. <laughs> Beautiful, no? Like finest porcelain, unblemished, unmarked as if nothing had ever happened to it. And that is, of course, why I like you so terribly, terribly much, as I most awfully, awfully do. Are you starting to get my drift? Are you sensing where this all might be going? Or are, rather, are you getting the impression that we're not going anywhere at all? Yes? No? A little irritating, perhaps? Well, I, I do hope not. I'd hate to have gotten under your skin. It would seem so unfair. After all, you haven't even gotten onto mine, let alone underneath it. I wouldn't like you so terribly, terribly much as I most awfully, awfully do. If your effects upon me should have proven to have been so well, penetrating, not at all. If it hadn't been for the fact that nothing has ever happened to me, my beauty would have been ruined. And you, my dears, are that nothing that happened. Really, it is a love story. One day, nothing came my way. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>